one of the biggest theological seminaries in all of Africa is Scott Theological Seminary, about 30 miles from Nairobi, Kenya, the capital of Kenya. This seminary is a five-year intensive course for training ministers of four different denominations, mainly the Baptist. It's also the Lutheran, the Anglican, and the Presbyterian. This is a five-year course, and at the end of the course, for the students that are about to graduate, they give them a class called the Four Cults. And the Four Cults are Mormons, Christian Science, Jehovah Witnesses, and Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we were one of the largest denominations in Kenya, so the professor said to the students, would you like me to invite a Seventh-day Adventist pastor so you know how to handle them? And they said yes. So the professor, who was from Great Britain, wrote a letter to our president of the East African Union, and I was called in since I was the minister's secretary of the union, and he said to me, would you please go and defend our church? Now, colleges in America, the students have lots of entertainment, but in Africa, they don't have all that entertainment. So one of the things they enjoy is debating. So I wanted to make sure what they had in their library about my church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. So I went two hours before my time, and I was pretty surprised. They had almost all of Ellen G. White books. They had questions on doctrine. They had movement of destiny. Plus, they had in their magazine rack, the ministerial magazine that our church pulls out. They had Doc, uh, uh, Desmond Ford's magazine called Evangelica. They had another series of magazine by Robert Brimsmith and also several issues of Pilgrim's Rest that put out all the dirty linen about our church. So I said to myself, I'm sure there is nothing I can hide from these students. So I went to the professor's office and introduced myself. And you know what he said? When the other students heard you were coming, they want to be in the debate. So we're having it in the chapel. So I said, sure. We walked into the chapel. It was packed not only with students, but also with missionaries from these four denominations. And I said to the professor, this looks like a firing squad. And he said, they'll be tough on you. So after the introduction, this young senior student stood up and kind of sarcastically said to me, please defend the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the investigative judgment in the light of justification by faith. And I did. And when I finished... The professor who was sitting behind in, on the platform stood up and said, is this what your church teaches? If it does, we have no right to call you a cult. And he shook my hand as my brother in Christ. Now, I want to cover this judgment in the light of the gospel. So our study is going to be the end time investigative judgment, sometimes referred to as the pre-advent judgment of the believers in the light of the everlasting gospel. Why am I going to, why am I interested in this study? Here it is. More than any other doctrine, the judgment of believers has produced fear and insecurity in the lives of most Christians, not only Seventh-day Adventists, but many Christians. Why is this so? Because most Christians believe that their works will ultimately decide their eternal destiny. I would like to read you a quotation from the author of The Kingdom of the Cults, you know, Walter Martin. Listen to what he wrote in his book, Kingdom of the Cults, page 479. Holding as they do to the doctrine of the investigative judgment, referring to Seventh-day Adventists, it is extremely diff difficult for us, that is, evangelicals, to understand how they, Seventh-day Adventists, can experience the joy of salvation and the knowledge of sins forgiven. This is a major problem. But I'll tell you, when we look at this judgment in the light of the gospel, you will discover that it's indeed good news. And that's what I would like to do in this study. What they fail to realize, what believers who are insecure about the judgment fail to realize is changing their behavior from bad to good. And this is the emphasis of lots of legalists does not change our nature. 
In other words, this means that we remain sinners by nature, not by performance, even after probation closes, until the second advent, when this corruption puts an incorruption, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to 54, which we read before. And by the way, there are other texts that say the same thing. See, we are not sinners only by performance. We saw clearly in our first study of this series that we are sinners also by nature. And that nature does not change one iota, even after conversion, until the second coming of Christ. Luther was correct when he said every believer is 100% a sinner and 100% righteous at the same time. Simul justus et peccata. In other words, we are 100% sinners by nature, not by performance, but by nature, and 100% righteous in Christ. And this has caused the insecurity. When the facts of the, when the, facts of the believers, ju judgment, are examined in the light of the gospel and God's love, this doctrine turns out to be good news of great joy for all the people. And, it, and John makes that clear in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. And we'll come to that in a, a little later on. Now, the purpose of this study is to remove the fear plaguing so many believers and replace it with joy, peace, and assurance of salvation. To understand the, the judgment in the light of the gospel, we need to begin with the objective facts of the judgment. Now, what do I mean by the objective facts of the judgment? Well, to correctly understand this doctrine of the believer's judgment, we must begin with the objective facts of the judgment that Paul brought out in Romans 5 and other passages. So I'm reading Romans 5, verse 15 to 18. This is something that took place outside of us. It took place in two men, Adam and Christ, the last Adam. Okay, chapter 5 of Romans which I've read before, but I want to cover again, verse 15 to 18. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense, and that one man is Adam, many or the many, because that's how the original says, the many died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So what Paul is saying here, what Adam did affected the entire human race. Because he was the father. He represented the entire human race. He was the father of the human race. Likewise, Christ, when he took on our corporate humanity, became the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And therefore, he also represented the human race. The difference between these two men is what they did and the effect of what they did. Adam sinned and brought condemnation and death to all mankind. Christ obeyed. Therefore, the effect was justification unto life. The difference between these two men is this. What Adam did, we inherit. We have no choice there. What Christ did for the human race is a gift that has to be received. Well, let's go on. Verse 16 of chapter 5 of Romans. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. So when Adam sinned, the judgment unto condemnation came to all men. Now look at the second half. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Jesus died not only for Adam's sin that condemns us, but for our personal sins, which are many. That's why many offenses and in exchange brought about justification for all men. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, in other words, when Adam sinned, death came as a conqueror, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Folks, righteousness is a gift. You, you don't earn it. Of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Please notice what Paul says here. Those who receive what we, Adam did, we inherit. But what Christ did is a gift that has to be received. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign with Christ. 
These are objective facts. So the conclusion, verse 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all mankind, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all mankind, resulting in justification of life. These are objective facts. This took place something outside of us, in Adam and in Christ. Okay, now, our eternal destiny depends on which humanity we choose to belong. That's something you need to know. In Adam, we stand condemned to death. And we have no choice there. We inherit that. That's why babies die. By faith in Christ, our subjective status, our experiential status, immediately changes from death to life or from condemnation to justification. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus himself so that you are clear I am not presenting cunningly devised favors. Let the word of God speak. Chapter 5 of John, verse 24. Listen to what Jesus said. Most assuredly, in simple English, I guarantee you, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment. And the, the word there in the Greek is condemnation. Why? Because he has passed from death unto life. In other words, from condemnation to justification. And Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. Why? Because the Spirit in Christ Jesus has set us free, past tense, from the law of sin and death. And that's an objective truth also. So, our eternal destiny depends on who we choose to belong to. We can remain in Adam and then suffer the result of his sin, condemnation to death, or we can choose to say goodbye to Adam by surrendering to the cross of Christ, the old life, and accepting the new life of Christ, and now we stand justified by faith in Christ. This does not exempt, folks, this conversion, this justification by faith experience, does not exempt believers from standing before the judgment seat of Christ. There are some Christians who think that Christians will not have to stand before the judgment seat of God or Christ because they have already been justified and God says, I know them that are his in Timothy. So I would like you to look at Romans chapter 14 where Paul corrects this error. You see, we human beings are experts at judging and condemning others. This took place in Rome. It takes place today. And Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome in chapter 14, verse 10. Listen to what he wrote. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, stop judging each other. You know, we see things differently. We behave differently. And we tend to judge each other. If you don't do exactly as I do, you're a sinner. You won't be saved. Folks, judgment belongs to God, not us. You know why? Because we cannot read the hearts of people. God looks at the heart. That is why when Paul was persecuting the church, his heart was right. He thought he was serving God, even though his behavior was terrible, killing Christians, putting them in prison. But his heart was right. And because God knew that, God met him on the Damascus road and converted him. But every one of us will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So stop judging. That's what Paul is saying. The purpose of this judgment, and I want you to be clear on this, is to vindicate the believers against the accusations of Satan. You see, when Christ comes the second time, he's going to take sinners to heaven. Yes, he may give us, he'll give us victory over sinning, but we are still sinners by nature. He's coming to take sinners to heaven. And we are told in Revelation 12 verse 10 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, the believers, who accuses us day and night. And I like verse 11. We overcome his accusation by the blood of the Lamb. Not by our performance, by the blood of the Lamb. And we are not afraid to die. 
because we know in whom we believe. Okay, now, the, this must take place, this judgment of believers must take place before Christ can legally take us to heaven. Many Christians believe that the judgment of believers, like the unbelievers, will take place at the second coming of Christ. Folks, there is a problem with that conclusion. When Christ comes the second time, he will not come as an advocate. He'll come as king and conqueror. Who will defend you in that judgment? No, no, the judgment has to take place before he comes. That's why it is referred to by the term pre-advent judgment. He has to prove to Satan and to the universe and to the angels that he has a right to take us to heaven in spite of the fact that we are sinners. That's why this is good news. Okay, now, how does Christ vindicate the believers? This is something we need to know so that we may have peace and assurance in these difficult days. The New Testament contains two groups of texts which seem on the surface to contradict each other. And this has created a problem. Here are they. On the one hand, it declares salvation is a gift experienced by all who by faith receive Christ as their personal Savior. The New Testament is absolutely clear. Let's read this text. Romans 3.28. <coughs> Pardon me. Romans 3.28. Listen to what Paul penned there. Romans 3 and verse 28. Can you see why Romans is a wonderful book? Chapter 3, 28. Therefore we conclude that a man or a person is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Then you go down to chapter 4, verse 5. But to him who does not work, that is, produce righteousness, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, and that Greek word means the wicked. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Very clear. Then go to Ephesians chapter 2 and notice what Paul pens there. Chapter 2 of Ephesians verse 8 and 9. For by grace, that is the obedience of Christ, you have been saved. Through faith, that is how it becomes ours. We receive the righteousness of Christ by faith. Or through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our works, important as they are, do not contribute towards the salvation. And it's one more text, Titus, a little book that is just before Philemon, which is just before Hebrews. Here it is, Titus chapter 3. And verse 5, this is what Titus heard when, read when Paul wrote to him. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, have you got it? Not sinful acts, but righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Spirit. The Bible, the New Testament is clear. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone because of what Christ did alone 2,000 years ago. Now, please notice, on the other hand, the New Testament clearly states that believers will be judged and rewarded according to their works. And this seems to contradict the previous text we read. Matthew 16. Let's read them. Matthew 16 and verse 17. And most of this text, not all, but most of this text are spoken by Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 16 and verse 27. Listen to this. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his what? Works. Now turn to John. John chapter 5. And please notice what Jesus, this is Jesus talking also. Verse 28 and 29. No, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Now look at verse 29. And come forth 
those who have done good. Have you got it? Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Doesn't this sound like salvation by works? It does. That's why there's a problem with these two groups of texts. Then to 2 Corinthians. Now we go to Paul, the champion of justification by faith. And listen to what Paul wrote in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians and verse 10. This is what he penned. For we, now remember he's writing to believers, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Here again, believers will be judged. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Have you got it? We are judged by what we do, good or bad. And Revelation 22 verse 12 says that when Christ comes, he will come to reward us according to our works. So what do we do with these two groups of texts that seem to contradict each other? Do you know, we human beings, we Christians do not like contradiction in Scripture. So the thing that most believers do, they prefer to choose one group of texts at the expense of the other. Some prefer the first group of texts. And evangelicals are famous for that. Others, those who believe in salvation by works of the law, prefer the second group of texts. But the fact is both are inspired and in most cases spoken or written by the same person. So the question is, how do we reconcile these two groups of texts? We can't ignore it. How do we reconcile these two groups of texts that seem to contradict each other? One says we are saved by grace apart from law keeping. We are saved by faith in Christ apart from what we do. The other says we'll be judged and rewarded according to our works. Okay, the solution is is this, this seeming contradiction. This is the solution. There is a third group of texts that harmonizes the two above groups. What is this third group of texts? What are they? Genuine justification by faith always produces works. These works do not save us. I made this, I've mentioned this many times. But these, are, these works are evidence of our salvation in Christ. Let's read this text now. That's harmonized. First we go to Jesus. John chapter 14. In John 14, Philip comes to Jesus and says to him in verse 8, show us the Father. You've been speaking about your Father, but show us your Father that we may see what he is like. And a very interesting answer Jesus gave. Philip, have I been with you so long he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus came not only to save us, but to reveal the true character of the Father, that he's a God of love, not a God of vengeance. And then Jesus said to Philip, and the disciples who were there, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. My works prove that the Father is dwelling in me and he's the one that does the works. Now, Let's look at verse 12 after these things that I've just mentioned. Look at verse 12 of chapter 14 of John. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. What has him going to the Father do with these great works? Because he said, if I don't go to the Father, I will not be able to send you the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, he will give you power to reflect me. So please remember, genuine justification by faith produces works. Now let's go back to the text we read. Ephesians chapter 2. We read verse 8 and 9. Where Paul makes it clear that we are saved by faith through grace apart from works. But this time I would like to read verse 8, 9 and 10 to get the whole picture. Chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now verse 10. For we are his, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works. Not only to go to heaven, but for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
So genuine justification by faith always produces works. Now the works may not be the same with every Christian. Some 34, some 64, some 104. That's what Jesus said. But genuine justification, genuine justification by faith will always produce works. Now let's go to Titus chapter 3. We read verse 5 in Titus. But now I want you to read verse 8. I'll read both now. Verse 5 of chapter 3 of Titus and verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 5 of Titus. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us to the washing of generation, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is justification by faith. Now look at verse 8. The same chapter. This is a faithful or trustworthy saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God, that is, the believers, should be careful to maintain good works. Ah, have you got it? Genuine justification by faith will produce good works or should produce good works. Now look at the next statement. These things are good and profitable to men, to mankind. In other words, these good works are not for the sake of the believer. He is not sure of salvation because of his good works. He is sure of salvation because of what Christ did for him and through him 2,000 years ago. Now, with this in mind, let's turn to James. Now, Luther had a hard time with James because he failed to realize that James was addressing a different kind of audience than Paul is. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. James is writing to the Jews of the dispersion. So these are Jews. And they have a separate problem from the Gentile. Now in J James chapter 2, in verse 14, 17, 20, he makes a very clear statement. Let's read them. Verse 14. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In other words, faith without works means that the faith is not genuine. It is dead. And then verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now remember he's writing to the Jews. Who is the father of the Jews? Abraham. So Christ brings up, now let's, let's go back before I come to this passage. James uses Abraham, the father of the Jews, the prototype to show the Jews, the Jewish believers, that justification by faith always produces works. Remember, faith, Abraham was justified by faith. He was counted righteous because he believed God's promise. Now, now James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Ah, have you got it? Abraham was justified by works. When he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? Please notice, Abraham offering Isaac did not make him perfect. It was proving that his faith was perfect. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled. And this is where Luther had a hard time. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he became the friend of God. And this is the passage from Habakkuk that Paul loves to quote. But look at James's interpretation, verse 24. You see then, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now to appreciate this, you need to understand the history of Abraham. God comes to Abraham at the age of 75, Genesis, 24, so Genesis 12, verse 4. And tells him to leave his country, leave his people and go to the land that he was going to give him, which is Canaan. And God promised him, out of Abraham, he said, I will make you a father of many nations. You will have many descendants. But Abraham had no children. He and Sarah had no children. He was 75, his wife was 10 years younger. So Abraham believed God, but they waited. One, two, five, eight years and no son came. And in Genesis 15, God said to Abraham, Why are you doubting my promise? 
And Abraham said, because you have not kept your promise. Where is the son? Is the son of my Eliezer, the promised son? And God said, no. The son I promised you will be from your loins. So he goes back home and says to Sarah, guess what? We are still going to have a son. And I can imagine Sarah saying, seeing is believing. So they wait another year. Two more years. Now it's ten years since the promise was made. No child. Sarah comes to Abraham and says, you know, two years ago God said to you, the son will be from your loins. But he mentioned nothing about me. I am convinced that God is incapable of giving you a son through me. Look, it's ten years now since the promise was made. God expects you to help him. So I have a suggestion. Go to my servant, Hagar, Use her as a surrogate mother and please help God to produce the son he promised. And like a good husband, he obeyed. And he produced Ishmael and he said to God, you promised me a son and I help you to produce it. Sometime you have, my dear listeners, read Romans, sorry, Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 28, where Paul will use the two sons of Abraham. Ishmael and Isaac, and use that as a model, as a metaphor, as an allegory of the two covenants which go right through the Bible, old and new covenant. The old covenant, theologically, is salvation by human effort. When Adam sinned, they covered their naked bodies by fig leaves. That's old covenant, human effort. God covered them with skins of animals that were sacrificed. That is the new covenant, based on God's promise. Ishmael stands for salvation through human effort. That is the old covenant. Isaac stands for salvation by God's promise. You need to read Galatians 4, 21 to 28, which ends by these words. You Christians, like Isaac, are children from above. The promise of God. But now, Since God rejected Ishmael as the promised son, when did he give the, keep his promise? Do you know God waited some 13 more years? He waited until Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. He waited until it was impossible for Abraham to produce a child through Sarah. And God comes to Abraham and says, Do you still believe I can keep my promise? And I like Abraham's answer. God, I believe all things are possible for you. And God said to Abraham, I'm sick and tired of your faith going up and down. I want to seal it so that it becomes unshakable. And the sign of that seal was circumcision. You'll find this in Romans 4 verse 11. Circumcision was not an added requirement for salvation. It was the seal of righteousness by faith. And one year later, when Abraham was 100 years old, and his wife was 90 years old. Isaac was born. And Isaac is called laughter. And three years later, when it, when it was time to win Isaac, Sarah walked into the room and saw Ishmael poking his finger at Isaac and mocking him. Why were you born? Before you were born, I was number one. Now I'm second fiddle. And she goes to Abraham and says, Look, Abraham, I do not want this son of yours, Ishmael, and his mother, Hagar, to be in the same home. Get rid of them. And Abraham must have said to Sarah, Sarah, look, Ishmael is my son. How can I get rid of him? So they had a squabble, and they did what every family that has problems do should do. They went to God. And God said to Abraham, this time Sarah is correct. Last time when she said, go to Hagar and produce a son, that was not from me. But this time she's correct. These two sons of yours, Ishmael and Isaac, can never live together. And do you know, folks, we are seeing that even to this day. The Arabs, the Palestinians, are the descendants of Ishmael, and the Jews are the descendants of Isaac. You know, when I first went to Jerusalem, 
I went to the famous mosque that was built that is built over the temple of the uh, the, uh, the temple of God that was destroyed in 70 AD. It's called the Dome of the Rock, and I wondered why they call it the Dome of the Rock. Well, under the dome, right at the basement, is a rock about 12 feet by 4 feet. And the Muslims, the Islamic people, believe that Abraham offered Ishmael on that rock, and the Jews believe that Abraham offered Isaac. But you see, folks, why did God wait 25 years before keeping that promise? To make a very important point, that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. He doesn't want your help. He waited until it was impossible for Abraham to have a child through human effort. And he kept his promise. And God has promised us salvation in Jesus Christ. He kept his promise 2,000 years ago. And if you believe in Jesus, you're your righteousness by faith will be rewarded by a great recompense. Now, circumcision sealed Abraham's faith. Some 17 or 20 years after Isaac was born, that faith was tested. Folks, it was a terrible test. God said, Abraham, take your big, only begotten son, Isaac, through whom I promised the Messiah, and sacrifice him, kill him for me. How would you respond to such a test of faith? Well, listen to how Abraham responded. Hebrews chapter 11. Listen, this is amazing. And that's the kind of faith we have to develop. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, the chapter of faith, is called the Hall of Faith. And we'll start with verse 17 up to verse 19. By faith, Abraham... When he was tested, what was God testing? His faith. Because this is the chapter of faith. Offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. And the word begotten, monogene, means somebody special. Because through him God promised the Messiah. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. In other words, the Messiah will come through Isaac. Now verse 19, Abraham concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. In other words, Abraham said to himself, God, I have reached the point that when you make a promise, you keep it. And if I kill him, I know you will raise him up. In other words, his faith was perfect. And that's the kind of faith we must have, especially as we face crisis in this world. Christ brings up these works of faith. Not the works of the law, which is legalism. Works of faith, which is in harmony, of course, with the law. But we, works of faith is not doing something to be saved. Works of faith is the fruits of justification by faith. Christ brings up these works of faith in the judgment, not to prove the righteousness of believers. Abraham offering up Isaac did not prove his righteousness. Proved his faith was perfect. He brings up our works of faith to prove not to prove our righteousness of believers, but to demonstrate that their faith in him is perfect, is complete. This gives him the legal right to represent us in the judgment. And that's what James 2:21 to 24 say. In other words, Christ turns to Satan, the accuser, and says, look, yes, they are sinners. Your accusation is correct. But these people, these believers are resting in me for their salvation. Their works of faith is evidence. Is proof. Is the witness. That they are resting in me. Now if you want to condemn them. You have to point one sin in me. And you know folks. He cannot do that. And that's the good news of judgment. Once Christ has established this fact. That he has a legal right. To take us to heaven. A legal claim. The right to take believers to heaven. On the basis of his righteousness which we receive by faith. And Romans 10 verse 4 says so. Then Christ can come. He can say to Satan, I rebuke you. You have no claim on these people. They are mine. And with this in mind, let us conclude by turning the passage on the judgment. Daniel chapter 7, which deals with the judgment of the believers, the house of God. 
when I first heard Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, it really produced fear in me. Why? Listen to the judgment. Chapter 7 of Daniel, look at verse, or listen to verse 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days, that is the Father, was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Have you got it? His throne is a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. So here is God on his throne, which is on fire, because God is a consuming fire. Paul brings that out in Hebrews. And the wheels are a burning fire. Now look at verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. These are the angels. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. This is the investigative judgment. And our knees, my knees began to knock. Because I knew I was a sinner. I knew I had failed to keep my promises to God. But then I read verse 22. Listen to the good news. Verse 9 and 10 is the trial. This is the investigation. Verse 22 is the verdict. Until the Ancient of Days came, which is a repetition of verse 9, and a judgment was made, this is the verdict, in favor of the saints of the Most High. So who wins the case in the judgment of the believers? The prosecutor, which is Satan, or the defense lawyer, which is Christ. And of course, the text is that Christ wins the case. Judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, the believers. And then the second part of verse 22, and, at, and the time came that after the verdict, the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. In other words, once the verdict is made, once Jesus defends the believers, through this investigative judgment. Once he proves legally that he has a right to take believers to heaven, not because of their righteousness, but because their faith in him has been proven to be correct by their works of faith, then only will he come to take us to heaven. And he will say to us at the second coming of Christ, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So your performance has nothing to do with that. So my dear people, the investigative judgment is good news. This is the incredible good news of the judgment. It is no longer a doctrine of fear, but of hope, joy, peace, and assurance. And with this in mind, turn to 1 John. And as you turn to it, the epistle of John, 1 John, chapter 4, I want to give you my experience. Before I understood the meaning of this, purpose of the investigative judgment. I used to pray, Dear Lord, please don't bring up my name as yet. I'm not yet ready. Well, I have news for you. You, will, you can live as long as Methuselah and you'll never be ready on basis of your performance. But once I discovered the incredible good news of the gospel and the significance of the investigative judgment in the light of that gospel, now I pray, Dear Lord, Please bring my name up as soon as possible. I'm looking forward to the day when you'll shut the mouth of my accuser. But now 1 John chapter 4. First of all, I would like to read verse 9 and 10 to get the context. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 and 10. And this is the love of God was manifested towards us. In this the love of God was manifested or revealed towards us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Have you got it? Jesus came here that we might live, even though in Adam we stand condemned. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God. Have you got it? Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the covering for our sins. God took the initiative. God takes the initiative even today. We don't take the initiative. God comes to us with good news. He says, look, don't run away from me. I sent my son to re redeem you. And by his life, death, and resurrection, 
He has obtained for you salvation full and complete. He has reconciled you to me by his death. He has justified unto life by the cross of Christ. Why are you running away from me? And when we realize what took place, we turn around. And that's what repentance means. Repentance comes from two Greek words. Metanoia means a change of mind. Before we were afraid of God. We were running away from him. But now we realize he's a God of love. And that he has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. We turn around and say, thank you God for your indescribable gift. Now with this in mind, look at verse 16 to 18 concerning the judgment. 1 John chapter 4 verse 16. Listen to this. And we have known and believed. Two things. We need to know. That's why we covered a study on the love of God. We need to know and believe. Even though it sounds too good to be true. The love that God has for us. The love that God has for sinners. For his enemies. God is love. Please notice. It does not say that God, one of God's attributes is love. God is love. Period. Everything that he does including his judgment, is based on his love. And he who abides in love, that is God's love, abides in God and God in him. Now look at verse 17. Love, that is our understanding and belief in God's love, has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Have you got it, dear listener? We should have boldness in the day of judgment. Why should sinners have boldness in the day of judgment? Here's the reason. Not because our performance is perfect, even though we will stop sinning before probation closes. But this is the reason. Because as he, Christ is, as he is, so are we in this world. God looks at Christians as they are in his son. And there is no condemnation in the father's eyes or the son's eyes or the Holy Spirit eyes for those who have accepted Christ as their believer. Now verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love will cast out fear. That is why I said in our last, last study before last, the supreme sacrifice of Christ, that was the demonstration that God gave human beings. That he loves us more than himself. Never ever doubt the love of God. And I gave you a passage, Romans 8, 35 to 39, to memorize. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul says, persecution, famine, distress, nakedness. In all these things, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us in Jesus Christ. There is no fear in love, verse 18 of 1 John 4. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. That is torment of the judgment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Folks, if you are afraid of the judgment, you have not understood the love of God. But if you have understood the love of God, you realize that he will never let you down. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Christ is as a high priest because we come to God in his name. What should be our response, folks, to this incredible good news? Hallelujah, folks. May this truth bring you joy and peace in Christ, especially in these days when many are living in insecurity, living in fear because of what is happening in this world. You don't have to fear. Yes, you may have to suffer many things, but only for a season. And you know, I will tell you, when we were in Africa as missionaries, under Idi Amin and under communism in Ethiopia, our lives were in danger constantly. And my wife had a text that she used to say all the time. It was out of context, but it had special meaning for her. It came to pass. Nothing happens forever. It came to pass. And she said, that is what I am holding on. That this problem that we are facing, this persecution that we are facing, the danger of our life that we are facing is not permanent. It came to pass. One day, Christ will save us. In reality, when he comes to take us to heaven. So my dear people, the purpose of the judgment is not to find out whether you're good enough to be saved. You will never be good enough. The purpose of the judgment is to vindicate you against the accusations of Satan. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all on our side. That is why we need to say hallelujah. Thank God for his wonderful grace. That is my prayer in Jesus' name.